You're listening to Pushing the Envelope, Life at the Cutting Edge of Customs Innovation. I'm Tom Muller with the Cross-Border Research Association. On this show, we explore the frontiers of customs creativity in conversation with customs and logistics experts, technology innovators, policymakers, research scientists, and other leaders in the field. Industry insiders call this show the PenCast because it's part of PenCP, a network for boosting customs innovation funded by the European Union under the Horizon 2020 program. Today, I'm speaking with Satya Prasad Sahu, known to his many friends and admirers as SP. SP is Senior Trade Facilitation Specialist at the World Bank. Previously, he served in a range of roles in trade and finance, including senior positions in Indian Customs under the Ministry of Finance of the Government of India, as well as Senior Technical Officer of the World Customs Organization. Hello, SP. Thank you for joining me on Pushing the Envelope. Thank you, Tom, and it's good to be here. To start off with, would you please tell me a bit about your background and career history at national WCO and World Bank levels and what brought you to the World Bank? First of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, you know, currently uh, I am based in Washington, D.C., working with the World Bank in the Global Trade and Regional Integration Unit. Uh, before joining the World Bank, I had the opportunity to work uh, in, in, in the government of India with the Customs Service, as well as with the World Customs Organization. Um, during my time in Indian Customs, my focus primarily revolved around technology projects and policy, policy matters in customs and border management. Um, at the WCO, I had the privilege of working extensively in the field of international trade um, and transport uh, technology, including data standards the application of information and communication technology that supports international trade. Some of the notable projects that I was involved in include the development of the WCO data model uh, version 3.0, and we'll come to that a little bit later, uh, I hope, um, and update, updating the ICT guidelines for customs, um, creating uh, the single window compendium, and, and also on passenger reporting standards. These are some of the technical areas I was involved in at the WCO. Uh, it, it, it prepared me for a task that I love doing, which is to implement uh, projects and also support countries with technical assistance programs. That's that sounds fantastic. It's a great combination when you can you can bring a lot of expertise and background to something, but also enjoy the day to day of your of your work. Um, I, if I understand correctly, you're part of a, a multifaceted global team at the World Bank. Could you speak a bit about that team and uh, the core competences of the team members? Absolutely, trade trade actually plays a vital role. Uh, in, in growing the economies of countries and in supporting the World Bank's twin goals of ending poverty and boosting shared prosperity. So by enabling countries to participate effectively in global trade and fostering regional integration, uh, we contribute to creating opportunities uh, for, for poverty reduction and improving the overall well-being of people, particularly in the developing nations. Our global team at the World Bank actually focuses on some critical aspects that continue, contribute to the growth, uh, growth of trade in, in developing countries. One of the core competencies lies in assisting governments to formulate appropriate trade policies. It's important that countries have access to markets in order to trade. And, and regional trade is in particular very important and our team members work closely with governments to develop the regional dimension of trade, including cross-border trade across land borders. This aims to strengthen the economic integration within regions, which is super important, and foster you know, beneficial trade relationships among neighboring countries, which is really good for the economies. Uh, mark, market access is not sufficient for, for trade growth. Uh, to facilitate the participation of, of companies, firms in international trade. Uh, another set of colleagues in our unit work to support governments in analyzing those policies to enhance the competitiveness of those firms, uh, which means that we strive to help them become more resilient and, and thrive in global value chains 
and, and ensure that their participation in those value chains is continuous and that their, the, the growth is sustained in terms of their participation in trades. Lastly, I come to my specific area of expertise. Uh, my colleagues and I work together on trade facilitation and logistics. Uh, my colleagues and I work to support governments to enhance their capacities to facilitate international trade. And this includes various aspects of developing transport connectivity, uh, trade supporting infrastructure, uh, the implementation of trade facilitation measures, promoting the digitalization of trade processes, and improving efficiencies in the logistics sector. Overall, what all of these teams bring together is diverse set of expertise and collaborate across various areas to support developing countries in accessing markets, enhancing competitiveness, and improving trade facilitation to drive the growth that we are looking for, and also uh, regional integration. Thank you. Wow. That's, I mean, a very, very impressive work model. Um, you know, an interdisciplinary team that looks both at the regional, the local, the regional, and the global, the micro and the macro. It's, it sounds like a very, uh, a very tightly integrated, very impressive uh, range of skills that you bring to bear. And it must also be fun to be working with uh, people from a wide range of different backgrounds and, and, and skills. Um, could I ask, what is the, why is the domain of your core competence, trade facilitation, so important for customs and for international trade? It's an, it seems like an obvious question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, Tom, for, the, for that question. Uh, it's a crucial one. The essence of trade facilitation lies in improving efficiency and reducing costs associated with cross-border trade. You know, trade is about the value of the goods, but everything around the trade in the process, etc., is all costs, which the consumer ultimately pays. Every export and import involves, you know, a lot of paperwork, convoluted processes, knocking on different doors, getting multiple signatures, bureaucratic bottlenecks. All those things are not only added costs, but also they severely impact on the speed and the reliability of the supply chain. Now, the role of trade facilitation is to streamline those processes, cutting away the redundant and overly complex steps, making the entire process quicker and less burdensome. It's like streamlining a traffic system, you know, um, mm. the less congestion, the faster and more efficient the movement of goods. It's, it's more or less like that. But in, it involves three types of flows, the flow of paper, the flow of information, uh, the flow of goods and flow of payments, all of those flows need to be synchronized. And um, all this naturally reduces the costs for business, and, which often translates into more affordable products for consumers. And this also means more business for the traders and greater profits for the firms participating in international trade. But the benefits of trade facilitation extend beyond the cost and time efficiencies. Uh, it also enhances transparency and fairness in international trade. When processes become very transparent and rules are clear, it ensures that all firms, not just a few, and, and regardless of their size and influence, uh, have, have great participation, equal access uh, to global trade. Uh, it fosters a sense of inclusivity and level playing field, which is very important for the growth of the small and medium enterprises and also creates a healthy competition and fair trade. So in a nutshell, the domain of trade facilitation is vital to customs and to international trade because it acts as a catalyst for A, efficiency, B, cost reduction, C, transparency, and D, fair play. Does that sound right, Tom? That sounds fast. Yes, that does. I'll have to digest it and think about it a bit, but it makes perfect, perfect sense. I mean, trade facilitation is vital to customs and international trade and therefore a key part of what the World Bank is thinking about. Um, in broader terms, how would you describe the activities of the World Bank in trade facilitation? So the World Bank plays a very important role in advancing trade facilitation globally. Uh, it's a major provider of assistance in this area particularly with customs modernization. And it does it through multiple ways. Uh, firstly, 
It provides extensive technical assistance and advisory services, financial support, um, and, and World Bank is very great at very good at convening. Um, so it's convening services, bringing all of the important players around the table um, and integrating them in a manner that benefits the, mem the countries that we are working in. This is backed by actually a multidisciplinary approach that I mentioned before uh, in analyzing and, and diagnosing the challenges and the needs of a country and to ensure that we provide tailored solutions. The World Bank activities also en encompass uh, the creation of uh, valuable research and data products. Um, mm -hmm. You must have heard about the Logistics Performance Index, which was launched uh, in April 2023, which ranks the countries based on their trade logistics performance. Uh, this forms the basis of our data-driven dialogue. You know, we need to have research products on the table uh, to have a solid discussion with our counterparts in government and as also the industry. We need to uh, enable uh, that discussion to have an adaptive design on the particular trade facilitation strategies that fit in that country scenario. When it comes to financing, the World Bank is a leader uh, in this uh, and the World Bank invests in major trade facilitation infrastructure um, support and, and also supports institutional reform projects. Uh, as of now, the current portfolio of trade facilitation projects exceeds $7 billion and includes um, the World Bank loans, the IBRD loans, the IDA grants, and the technical assistance that we provide through donor funding. So in addition to uh, all of the above, actually, we are also a strong advocate for, uh, for, for open markets and, multi and the multilateral trading system led by the WTO. And we promote uh, the dialogue on promoting fair trade and inclusive trade globally. Uh, and we could talk about that later if needed. Uh, and the most important thing to note is that the World Bank doesn't work in isolation. In fact, its efforts are amplified through, through, through strong and strategic partnerships that the World Bank has, both at the global level as well as at the local level. Globally, we collaborate with international organizations, principally with the World Trade Organization, the World Customs Organization, the International Maritime Organization, uh, the International Plant Protection Convention Secretariat of the Food and Agricultural Organization, and I can go on and name many others. And at the local level, it's especially important that we work very closely with the national government, uh, specifically um, we focus on the customs and the trade department, but also uh, the transport and the uh, other government agencies dealing with sanitary and phytosanitary uh, controls. Uh, we also work with extensively with the private sector, and our engagement with the private sector is through the trade and industry associations. So, in a sense, the World Bank works, World Bank's work in trade facilitation is complex and it's multifaceted. It is aimed at creating more efficient and fair and competitive global trade environments. Uh, and and we, we believe that we excel in doing what we are doing. That, yeah, the, co the cooperative, co the uh, collaborative work that you have with international organizations is, 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 is obviously a critical part of, of what you do. How, how does the World Bank support governments in implementing the WTO trade facilitation agreement? Great question, Tom. The World Bank, uh, from the start, has played a critical role in supporting governments, especially for the developing and least developed countries, um, in implementing the WTO TFA. The TFA, we all know, is an absolutely vital international instrument that seeks to simplify and modernize trade for trade procedures uh, and to make them more efficient and less complex. Uh, Complex trade procedures actually contribute to non-tariff barriers significantly. So what we do uh, on the WTO TFA is that um, we, uh, we assist the governments and, and we take advantage of the fact that the agreement includes provisions for assistance and support of capacity building in developing and least developed countries. There is a, there's a section within the TFA for that. Uh, this empowers 
uh, the countries to bolster their, bolster their trade facilitation measures and allows them to fully participate in global trade. Uh, to assist these countries, uh, the WTO created what's called a TFAF, or the Trade Facilitation Agreement Facility. This facility provides essential resources for the TFA and aids the countries in assessing their needs for implementing the TFA and assists them in obtaining the aid that they need. Mm. Additionally, uh, the, the Trade Facilitation Facility also arranges for the funding uh, and to countries that are struggling to find the funds. And the facility also performs the function of matchmaking. Um, the, the beneficiaries are on, on the one side and the donors are, are on the other. And the facility acts like a platform where uh, the two are matched very well. And the goal is to enable uh, all of the countries to implement uh, the TFA in a full and effective manner. And so far, the World Bank uh, has ha assisted over 50 countries uh, in their pursuit of uh, these objectives. Uh, so you can see that the World Bank's role is very, very significant in enabling and streamlining the implementation of the TFA, particularly in the developing and least developed countries. So uh, another important thing about the TFA is that it promotes the use of information and communication technologies in international trade. Um, the TFA advocates paperless trading through electronic payments, documentation, and automation, uh, and that gives a boost to the efficiency. And today, everything is heading towards digital, and therefore, the TFA uh, is right in emphasizing automation. So, the, the enablement of online access to trade-related information, including laws and regulations and procedures, which are the transparency provisions of the trade, but also the automation of customs procedures to, to, to reduce errors and, and, and to suppress corruption and, and, to, and to streamline the processes. Automation is very, very important. And in particular, there's a, there's a, there's a measure in the WTO TFA that requires countries to introduce single window systems to ease uh, document submission. Um, you know, instead of going to multiple agencies, the trader could submit all of the documentation at a single entry point uh, to ensure that there are enhanced efficiencies, you know, and the costs are cut for doing business um, to enable smoother flow of trade and faster alignment uh, with global standards. And that's the primary objective of the TFA. This is this is uh, this is like getting a PhD at high speed here for me. <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, so many of the words that we talked about earlier. I mean, automation, modernization, efficiency. All of these require and revolve around digitalization. Wouldn't you say? Um, what What are the steps that that government and businesses can can take to digitalize trade? So absolutely, I mean. Automating custom systems is not just about launching um, a, a, an IT project uh, to make a website appear or to, to, to implement a, an ICT solution in customs. Uh, and and it, it's, it's, it's quite involved and it's much more than that. And that's basically my area of professional confidence. Uh, digitalizing trade involves a blend of you know, technological investments, policy reforms and enact the, the enacting of enabling laws, but also skill development. Firstly, the governments and the business need to invest in solid digital infrastructure, which means to you know, extend internal internet and to make internet speeds good, uh, to make internet accessible. And these, are, these, are, these things actually form the backbone of uh, digital trade. This could also mean um, Broadband connectivity, uh, as well as you know, uh, the creation of uh, uh, e-commerce platforms that facilitate online transactions. It's not enough to have just customers part of automation in place. The wider trade infrastructure and the transport infrastructure should also be digitally enabled. Otherwise, it could be a very lopsided digitalization process. Um, the legal and the soft infrastructure are also quite important. 
there needs to be in place data protection laws, e-commerce regulations, and, and generally the policies that support digital the digital economy. And, and we have colleagues in our unit that work exclusively on uh, the digital economy part. Um, ensuring legal frameworks are in place is super important. Um, and, and legal in, uh, uh, the legal framework to protect online transactions, uh, to call them equivalent to paper-based transactions, um, protection of commercial data. Um, all of these things are very important to increase uh, the confidence of the trade in digital processes and digital trade. Secondly, there needs to be in place uh, other aligned facilities like you know digital payment systems and um, and, and uh, transparency provisions that allow access to information. Technology has the potential to revolutionize uh, all of these things, but the basics need to be in place. Uh, apart from what I mentioned, to increase uh, the trust and confidence in online transactions, there needs to be the implementation of the concept like electronic signature um, and, and the like. Um, the elect uh, the treating digital evidence as equivalent to you know, evidence provided in hard copy papers. Uh, all of those things require the legal infrastructure to be in place. And none of these things can happen without the right skills. Investing in training and education of the users uh, is very important. Unless the people are equipped to use the systems, they cannot participate in the digital trade processes. Uh, so digital literacy, um, cybersecurity, uh, and, and a range of other competent competencies allow traders and uh, service providers in the logistics industry to make the best use of digital technologies. So I can sum it up by saying that, you know, digitalizing trade doesn't emerge in a vacuum. It is actually a multifaceted process and involves a range of technologies, but also, you know, regulatory reforms and human capacity development. This concludes the first part of my conversation with SP Sahu. Senior Trade Facilitation Specialist at the World Bank. Tune in soon for another episode of our conversation. Thank you.